Terry was treated no different from the rest of us and was issued with the following from the hospital stores. Three shirts, three vests, three pair of underpants, three singlets, three pairs of pyjamas, one jacket, one pair of jeans, one pair of trousers, one pair of black shoes. Terry's smile was sometimes a bit sheepish, his laughter a little guilty occasionally, and he did look used and cheated. He wasn't that dark around the eyes, but he was a middle-aged, chronic, melancholic, paranoid schizophrenic. Like the rest of us, Terry's week revolved around his gyro for £7.60. pence. On gyro day, he would walk down the hill, then from the foot of the hill, the hundred yards to the post office. He would cash his cheque and then go to the off-licence. He would find a quiet place away from the passers-by to drink his special brew. Paul also drank on his gyro day, but they were both solitary drinkers. There was no drinking school on the ward, no covering each other when either one did not have enough for a beer. One day, while skiving from industrial therapy, I found Paul in an alley in Causton. He had a carrier bag of John Smith's, cramming them down to get drunk. I asked him if he wanted to go to Croydon, and we caught the bus. He had a bus pass, but he turned back at Purley. He did not want his routine interrupted. Terry also became an institutionalised drinker. After drinking, like Paul, he would quietly return to the ward and lie on his bed. The interaction between the tranquilizers and the alcohol potentiate the effect of the alcohol, but the effect is short-lived, and soon he would be hoping to sleep off the drink. Eventually he would pass out into oblivion. The hospital shop. They used to say tobacco provided temporary respite from the side effects of the medication. The corridor smelt of stale tobacco and cats, as there are often many semi-wild cats in the hospitals. Not any old tobacco either, but the strong stuff, Anstey's Brown Beauty, Pirate and Black Bell for cigarette or pipe. Brown Beauty and Black Bell were only obtainable from government sources and banned from Her Majesty's prisons. Terry had friends amongst the patients in the hospital, but he would ask them for money or cigarettes in rotation. One of them was Chris. The hospital shop. A serving counter at the back of the shop, a window at right angles to the left of the counter, a door at right angles to the right, a narrow counter table that runs at right angles to the serving counter, which then turns into a narrow counter for customers parallel to and in front of the serving counter. Terry. How are you, Chris? Chris. I haven't got any money. I've squandered it already this week. Terry. Turning to the narrator, William Burroughs squandered his inheritance and Chris squandered his gyro, then to a porter who had just entered the shop. How are you? You couldn't lend me a pound, could you? Porter gives Terry a pound. Terry leaves the shop. Narrative. Terry was off down the corridor to wait for the small dark blue comma single deck bus that ferried patients and staff down the hill to the Brighton Road and the shops in Causton and back up the hill to the hospital. Chris, I don't like to lie to Terry, but I can't keep lending him money. Pause. Give me my Enditol tablets. Narrator, what do you mean? Enditol, end it all. You're not suicidal as well, are you? Chris, gesturing toward the door where Terry had left the hospital shop. No, Terry. Pause. I used to play the piano, you know. Narrator. After a fashion. Chris, exasperated. Yes, after a fashion. Narrator. Sorry, that didn't sound too clever. Chris. It's all right. I used to like Graham Bond. Narrator. He died under a train. Chris. I didn't know that. Narrator. Like Rose. You remember Rose on Browning? Chris. Yes, I remember. I don't know what's worse, dying like that or ending up like Peter. Narrative. Peter had been a soldier in World War II, one of the Poles who ended up living in the English psychiatric wards. During the war, Peter had tried to end his life by throwing himself under a train, but had survived the attempt, only to lose an arm and a leg in the process. In his wheelchair, Peter would sit outside the art room door in front of an easel. 
On a piece of newsprint, he would draw the same picture, a simple house, a common theme for psychiatric cases, in coloured pencil. Though he settled into the Guy Ward routine, Terry would occasionally rant against this situation. These rants were not alcohol-inspired, though every morning he took the tablets that were prescribed. On Guy Ward, Terry was prescribed haloperidol, an antipsychotic drug. Guy Ward Dormitory, Terry. Jack gave me a pink tablet instead of my usual blue tablet. Any idea why? Narrator. It's probably just a different make of the same drug. It happens with drugs. Like amphetamine. Terry, I don't think the drugs do anything anyway. I'm going to have a beer. I like to have a beer every day. It's a point of pride. Narrative. There was no way that Terry was going to work in the industrial therapy department like most of the other patients on the ward. After gyro day, Terry would wake up the next day with a good deal of his money gone and a few cigarettes left in his packet of Rothmans. While Paul would lie on his bed and wait for the next week's payment to buy beer and Michael would steal for his luxuries, Terry would wander down the corridors in search of one of the porters or maintenance workers. The trick was to tell the same hard luck story about how he was skint and how David Bowie, his millionaire brother, never sent him any money and would not visit him. There was an air of menace and desperation hidden behind a pretense of friendliness about his begging routine. But he did not get angry if he was refused. The inference was that should David Bowie get in touch, Terry might be able to repay the money he borrowed. At the hospital shop, Terry was one of the few customers allowed credit, and usually this took the form of the loan of a packet of 20 cigarettes, which he repaid. He would approach strangers in the corridor, in the shop, while waiting for the hospital bus. Terry would tell his hard luck stories to whoever he had decided might give him the price of a beer or at least a cigarette, even if they were a total stranger. Money was a source of grief for Terry. His mother sent him a birthday card containing just two pound notes and a message. Hospital corridor by a window. Terry to the narrator reading the birthday card. I'm sorry, I cannot send you more than this. This is all I can afford. You think my mother could afford to send me more than two pounds for my birthday? What with my brother being a millionaire? Terry turned tears up the card and throws it out the window. Narrative. This incident became collateral as Terry used it to embellish his prelude to another touch. That summer a woman from a cat charity was called in to not only count the animals but to take the animals away to be operated on so they could not have kittens. There were cats on every ward. Two or three hundred in the hospital was the estimate. It was impossible to count them all. Don't feed the cats, the patients were told, and so sources of milk appeared everywhere. Guy Ward, day room. Jack, at first to himself, then to Charlie Caldwell. They've been feeding the cats again. Was that you, Charlie Caldwell? Charlie Caldwell, putting a sandwich into a jacket pocket. No, Jack, I hate them. Jack, I'd shoot the lot of them. They're a fucking nuisance. Narrative. After the incident with Mario at the breakfast table, Terry would wait until the other patients had eaten before he ate, avoiding the nurse's surveillance even further. The only exception to this routine was Sunday dinner, the best meal of the week. Slices of nameless meat were served up with overcooked roast or mashed potatoes and the usual overcooked greens. This was followed by apple pie or apple crumble or stewed rhubarb and custard. While the patients were finishing their meal, the charge nurse would open a cupboard on the stairs to the ward hall across the corridor and return to the day room with half pint cans of Watney's light ale and brown ale, put them on the table nearest the door and allow patients to choose, first come, first serve. Terry finished his dinner quickly and downed a can of light ale. By the time the last patient had collected his beer, some did not want any. Terry had finished his. Guy Ward Dayron. Terry. Any chance of another beer, Jack? Jack. Go on then. Terry. Smashing, Jack. Joe won't let us have a second can. Jack. I'd do away with it. Terry. Would you, Jack? 
Why's that? I like a beer. Jack, it's a waste of money.